Verse 12, and I want you to focus with me on verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I might as well give you one more verse of Scripture. Can I give you all one more verse of Scripture? Continue reading in verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness, come on, say boldness. Now, you said that timidly. Come on, say boldness with some boldness. Come on, say boldness. Oh, come on now, y'all. Put your preacher voice up. Act like you're hollering at your spouse at home and you don't think nobody's ever going to find out. Come on, say boldness. boldness. All right, here we go. There we go. Now, so when they saw the boldness of Peter, <laughs> Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. They marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus that they had been with Jesus. I want to say that one more time. They realized, though, under, uh, though undereducated or uneducated, right? And my Bible reads not only that, but they, they were untrained men. Here's what they did take away about Peter and John. These men had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. I don't have a whole lot of time tonight, but I do want to talk about being with Jesus. Being with with Jesus. I may not even get to the text tonight. I may not even get to my notes tonight because I so passionately feel that this has been and shall be the call of God on my life. And as I look back at my life, I want you to just parallel with your lives. Many of you all have careers. You have hobbies. You have interests. There are things you involve yourselves in, but you can never mistake one for the other. You may get paid to do a job well, and you call that a career. But I believe that when you gave your life to Jesus Christ some 5, 10, 20, some 40, 50 years ago, that your calling, your calling, and this is why Paul writes, men think of your calling when you got saved. Listen, when you gave your life to Jesus, the whole, the whole game changed. Everything about life changed because it's more than making money. It's more than traveling the world. It's more than successes and accomplishments and achievement. Now, my life becomes, Paul would call it, a bond servant. My life now becomes submitted as a slave to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Why is this important? I'm not, not that I'm just realizing this, but I am now more intent and more adamant about fulfilling, not my career, but my calling that God gave me. And my calling, if nothing else, is that my wife and I, our family, our children, and one day soon to be grandchildren soon, whenever that day comes, uh, that we're closer to Jesus and we know Jesus, not just the church, not just denomination, not just the departments of the church, but I want to be able to say with my heart that my sons knew the Lord, my daughter knew the Lord, that my wife knew the Lord, that I knew the Lord, for that is my calling. And because I abide in the office of a pastor, my calling is that you know Jesus Christ, right? You may not go up the denominational ladder. Um, you may not be on the civic social boards of our community and religious rights, but you'll know Jesus Christ. So whether it is Sunday mornings, Thursday nights, small groups, rehearsal, Bible studies, there has to be a culture where we grow closer to the Christ of the cross, the Christ who resurrected from the dead. And we understand the atonement and we understand the redemption of his blood over our lives and for our lives. If, not, if this church is known for nothing else, not buildings, not location, not marketing, not social media, multimedia, may we be known that people grew closer to Jesus Christ, that people actually had an affinity and a calling to serve the Lord. Are you all with me so far? Okay, do you understand that? So, so it may not be popular. It may not even be something that you want to tweet about. But know that you are in a house where at the end of the day, it ain't about your money. It's not about your status. It's not about your educational background. But you know Jesus in the pardon of his sins. Why is this important? When I look back at Acts chapter 3, you know this past Sunday we talked about the message, look at us, look on us. We saw where Jesus, excuse me, we saw clearly where Paul, excuse me, Peter and John go up to the temple at the hour of prayer. Nothing new to them. This was their Jewish practice. This was their Jewish custom. So they go to church. They go to prayer meeting. But because they had had an experience 
for three and a half years that culminated not in the resurrection of the, excuse me, not in the dying on the cross, but it culminated in the raising from the dead. And when he said, go to Pentecost or go back to Jerusalem, dwell there for 50 days until I return. Now life goes back to sort of a routine. So we find them in Acts chapter 3, chapter verse 1 through 4 and 5. They're going to the temple. Oh, there's old, what's his name? He had been there all his life. He's been laying from his mother's womb. They carried him in every day. They carry him out every day. Okay, it's been a nickel today. It's been a dime today. It's been a shekel this day. It's been a, 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 a penny this day. But for whatever reason, this day, all business changed. There was not a new man. Wasn't a new circumstance. Wasn't no new money. But silver and gold have I none. But you know what? I've spent some time with the Messiah. I've spent some time walking with one who has revolutionized and changed the world. I'm going to put that to practice. I've seen Jesus turn water into wine and turn a whole wedding feast out. I've seen him raise Jairus from the dead. I've seen him heal my mother-in-law. I've seen him rebuke me and, 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 and prophesy to me and love me back to a state as a sane mind. I've seen all of these miracles and wonders and I've seen the supernatural. You understand that? So Peter, it, it, I don't know if it was day one, day two, day ten. We don't know. But what we know is today everything would change. So silver and gold have I none. You know the story. You already know that about me, right? But you know what? Here's what I do have. And I've had it for a while, but maybe today is the day I'll practice faith and lay hands on the sick. I've had this gift, I've had this anointing, I've had this authority for a while now, but maybe now is the day I'm going to sit my son down, look him dead in the eye, and speak life. Or my wife and I, we're going to sit down and figure out a pathway of reconciliation. I, I, I've been scared to start a business. I've been scared to go back to school. I've been scared to, to, to trust God for these certain areas in my life. And I've had this word. I've had the culture. I've had the, 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 the witnesses. But now is the day I'm actually going to stretch out my hand and see if this man will walk. This is going to be the day I'm going to give him a look. I'm going to give him a talk. And I'm going to give him a touch. And what do we see happening? We now fast forward. To, uh, to chapter 4. Now, of course, we know the man is healed. We know not only is he healed, but God does exceedingly, abundantly, above all, we can ask or we can think. May I remind you right now that whatever you're praying for, God wants to do more. Amen. And maybe the delay, and maybe the pause, and maybe the hesitation is because your vision isn't big enough. Your prayer isn't bold enough. Your wish isn't wishful enough. Maybe the reason God hadn't done what you want him to do is because he's waiting for you to add a little bit more faith. Does that make sense to anybody in the room? Okay? And so, and, so, and so not only did the man get healed, but he's leaping. He's running. He's jumping. And he is making a demonstrative witness that I am healed. You know, not like some of us church folk do now. We, we say we're healed, but we don't want to show nobody. You know, we don't want to uh, express that or we don't want to demonstrate that. This guy made no shame about God's touch on his life. He says, hey, I want to go to church with you. I want to hang out in the synagogue with you. Now, the religious right and the religious Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes, man, they're all tight and upset and mad, and they want to put all this to shame because, after all, they ain't getting no credit. They're not getting validated in none of this. This Jewish guy from uh, uh, Nazareth who came down and calls himself a self-prophet and a self-god, and uh, he, we don't know where he's at right now. He, uh, all, all we know is this. Somebody said he went back in the sky to be with God. But what we do now see is a miracle. And may I remind you, as we were singing tonight, as we were ministering to the Lord tonight, that he does great things. He does miracles. Don't get tired. Do not get tired. Do not get weary in well-doing. May I remind you, as I told you on the conference call a few, a few nights ago or a few days ago, you know, right when you get ready to throw in the towel, God throws that towel right back at you and says, wipe your eyes. I'm not finished with what I want to do in your generation. But I understand how tired and exhausting and how, how, how difficult and tempting things might become. So tonight we look at verse 4. Excuse me, we look at verse 8 tonight. Peter's giving the defense. Luke, who writes the book of Acts, makes it clear, hey, this is not that ordinary same old Peter that we've known. He's bold. He's filled with the Holy Ghost. He is now the leader he was called to be. He says, men, you already know the story. You know what has happened. But listen, if we're being judged for the good deed we've done by this man, by what means that he has been made well, verse 10, let it be known to you and all of the people in Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, he's throwing a little shade in, by the way, who, uh, by the way, you all crucified, whom God has raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you hold. I want to pause tonight, and I want to talk to you just for a little bit tonight about boldness. What it really means to be bold in your faith. 
what it really means to have a conviction to be bold in your walk with the Lord. I grew up in a church background where I was in a Baptist church. You know my story, you know my background. Not very little men, very little men in the church. And you know, it was just, you know, church wasn't that popularity thing for young men, particularly men of color, back when I was growing up. And so if we had any recollection or any uh, 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 um, connection or relevance with the church, it was always sort of a back burner conversation. It was always a, a back secondhand conversation, right? It was certainly not that we boasted and bragged about it and wanted to tell everybody in the world, right? But, 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 but it wasn't until 1988 until I actually saw with my eyes, you understand, other young men. And not only were just kind of going to church, singing on the choir and kind of doing their little churchy softball league things, but these men were actually bold outside of the church, Charles, you understand? They weren't just bold on Sundays. They were bold on the campus. They were bold in their business. They were bold on the field, whatever they were doing. And that struck a tone with me that, you know what, why would we be ashamed of the very thing that gives us life? Why would we be hesitant to talk about the very thing that gives us value and joy? And I get it. Culture has canceled. Our culture has pushed us into this corner of seemingly being ashamed. Now, all of the weirdos and all of the other people and all of the sin and all of the nude, lewd and crude, they come out of the closet, but the Christians seem to be hiding in the closet, right? Peter and John show us a difference. Verse 10, be it known that Jesus, whom you crucified, this is the one who has caused this man to walk. My first question to you as it relates to boldness is this. Are you bold enough to give God the glory and the credit for everything he does in your life? Amen. I wonder sometimes do some of us get stuck on stuck street, uh, get stuck on neutral street because God knows ahead that if I bless you too much, you'll go back to reverting to you being the one made it all happen. Amen. Sometimes I wonder, Oh, God, I had this conversation with a gentleman. I, I may get to it tonight, I may not. But sometimes I wonder, is, it, is God in all of his affinity and in, in all of his omnipotence, omniscience, that means he's all-powerful and all-knowing, I wonder sometimes that he see further up the road than we can see, and he knows. If I give them this, if I give them access to that, if I allow them to do this, they may turn. They may back away. They may stop giving me the glory and the honor. Peter cuts to the court here, and he wants the world to know, this isn't me. This isn't us. This is not the fraternity. This is not the group of men. This is Jesus the Christ, the one that you all said wasn't worthy to live. He is the reason, this man today, that you have seen all of your natural life walking, living, jumping, and now has new life. Boldness, point number one, always be willing and ready to give God the glory. Always be willing and ready. See, if you could give him glory over some of the smaller achievements in your life, you have no problem standing before millions and giving him the glory. Okay? Everybody okay so far? I want to keep reading verse 11. This is the stone which was written. Now, if you see that in parentheses, excuse me, not parentheses. Yeah, no, not parentheses. If you see it italicized, when you see text italicized, all right, you, you read that sort of with a caution. This particular text is only a fill-in. In other words, Luke or whoever came behind Luke added this scripture as a reminder from the Old Testament, something that says, hmm, this would be a great reference point. So what does Luke put in? Verse 11, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. If you see that italicized, there's a good indication it was not in the original text, okay? It was added for clarity or a fill-in for content. Whatever it does, whatever it doesn't matter to me. Jesus, the, the Holy Spirit has breathed on the text. It has been canonized for our use. If, now, that, now that we know that part, let's read what it means. So the same Jesus that you all crucified, the same one that you rejected, not only has he become a stone in the equation, he has now become the most important bedrock and cornerstone in the entire building. Why is this important to you and I tonight? The very thing you, excuse me, it's not the thing, but the very, the very, the very person you need is the one we're often tempted to deny. And that is Jesus the Christ. Verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other name under heaven given among men whereby we should know, we perhaps know we must be saved. I want our church to exist for giving the world Jesus. I want us to boldly, without any hesitation, and with clarity present a dying, hopeless world, Jesus the Christ. Now, that sounds elementary, it sounds understood, it sounds plain. But the reality is right now for most churches in America, that is a tall task to do. 
We must get back to the simplicity of presenting Jesus to the world. We got to get back to the common elementary found fundamentals of sharing in its most simplest form, Jesus. I said Sunday morning, when you talk to the young adults, they don't, they don't, they're not into the bells and whistles. They're not into the horse and pony show, and they're not all, all about the whole glitz and glamour and all the techno and all of the dancement. All that helps, and it certainly makes looks and sounds good. But can we have authenticity? Can we have genuine? Can we be in an atmosphere in a crowd where people are being genuine? Can you tell me your story without fabricating it? But I leave it out all the bad stuff. We want to know the good and the bad. Can you tell me how to overcome? Can you tell me how to survive? Can you tell me how to find joy in the midst of cancer? Can you tell me how is there possible life after a painful divorce? These are the things I believe we put on a platter for the world to know. And it comes through Jesus Christ. Let's keep reading verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, here's what they perceived. They're not the smartest men in the world. We like to say they're not the sharpest knife in the drawer. <laughs> the elevator don't quite go to the top, but here's what we know. They may be a little untrained. They may even be a little uneducated. But one thing we know is this. They have spent their time with this Jesus of Nazareth. I got to close this message in a few moments. So I want you to take some time to reverse the whole emphasis of this message. And I want you to look within. Are we daily spending more time with the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we walk daily? I didn't say annually, did not say seasonally, but every, every single day. Is there a consciousness? Is there a conviction that I got to be closer to the Lord Jesus Christ? How do I do that in my prayer time? How do I do that in my fasting time? How do I do that? Getting in the word of God. Am I, am I, am I displaying the love? I was kind of thumbing through social media. Or I think it was either this morning or yesterday. And I saw a pastor apologizing to his wife in front of all of the people. So, of course, I stopped. And said, okay, what is this going to be all about? You know, but, but, but. And I never did get to the bottom of what was going on, but he just wanted the world to know I don't want to be a hypocrite and duplicit and argue and huff and puff and fuss in by, behind closed doors and then get out Sunday morning and act like everything's grand. And I appreciated that. And I said, I, I really can appreciate because his motive is what I read in the scriptures. He wants his church to know Jesus. He wants his church to be more connected to Jesus than his personality, his strength or his weaknesses. And so these things being said, my question to you tonight, as we introspectively look within, are we gaining ground on knowing more of the Lord? This is not, this is not easy treading here. We have so many distractions right now. Think about this past Monday. You all do remember Monday. Now, I, I was a part of Monday. Y'all was too. We have that daisy in the sky, just looking and looking and looking and this wonderful phenomenon. I mean, good. And it was, it was impressive to see the clips. I think it was. But for me, but I try to quote unquote be deep because you get the carnal folk in the church. Hey, these preachers go getting deep again with all these prophecies. No prophecies here. I just amazed at the wonder of God that 93 million miles away, he could have created a sun hot enough to keep us warm, but not too hot to scorch us. Isn't it amazing? He can create a moon. And I'm not, I'm not a scientist by any means, not an astrologer, but for whatever reason, that thing rotates the way it rotates just enough to give a sun and a day and night. And even at nighttime, in the darkest of the night, if the moon's shining, it gives us enough light to know what we're doing and going where we're going. Isn't he amazing? And what a great time to remind the world of the excellence of God. This is no cosmic uh, 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 bang, big bang theory. This is no cosmic creation of, of, of just happenstance. There was a God who organized and was crafted. Put everything in there. And may we take this day to recognize that this is God. And if God can so do all of that in a chaotic, messed up world that was full of darkness, I wonder what he could do in your life and in my life and in our life. When they saw Peter and John, they perceived these guys, have, they've not gone to the highest institutions of learning. They hadn't gone to the seminaries and the theological institutions of whatever. But man, they spent some time with Jesus. So much, of the, so much of the point, not only did this man get healed through them, but now they're willing to continue the message further. I could go on in, in, in a little bit deeper in chapter four, but I want to remind you of three things that come to mind as we talked about uh, 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 the man at, at, at the gate called Beautiful. What did we see from Peter and John that day? We saw, we saw, we saw care and concern. We saw communion and, 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 and camaraderie, but we also saw Christ's compassion. 
We saw Christ's compassion. If you all remember Sunday, I asked for those takeaways. I asked for those uh, what I would call call to actions. Can we give ourselves to prayer? I was so blessed this morning on the prayer line to hear so many people being a part. And I want to thank you all because many of you all have held that down, even in my absence or training or whatever was going on. Thank you for that, because I do want our church to be known for being a church that's committed to prayer. If we think for a moment that it's going to be location or or, or preaching or singing that's going to fill the church and, and touch this world, we got another thing coming. May we undergird this in prayer. May we give ourselves to prayer. I ask you to be a prayer people given the purpose. Know why you exist in the earth. Okay? You're going to make your money. That's going to come. Right? You're going to meet some friends. That's going to happen. You're going to get married and engaged and kids and family. All, that. all that's going to happen. But when everything is said and done, know your why. Know your why. Why ultimately am I here? And I hope I'm not embarrassing myself when I say this, but I'm at 54 now, and I'm still, I'm still polishing that vision of what is my ultimate calling. Why? I find myself every once in a while in certain settings of saying, God, why don't I feel the connection like I used to feel here? I, I find myself in certain groups, I'm saying, I just don't sense. And so, God, what is it that you want me to do? We're getting older here. We got very little. Am I, am I talking all right tonight? We got very little time to waste. We're not getting younger. And so Peter said, make your calling and your election sure. Right? Take time to invest in your own identity. Your own calling. And then thirdly, I asked for passion. We got to return to passion. We have to get back to showing love unconditionally when people don't expect it the most. That's what I love about our church. That's what I love about this fellowship. That's what I love about you all. You are people getting, giving a prayer. You're still seeking your purposes. But if nothing else, may we be a people of passion. Jesus, when he saw the most, he was moved with compassion. I share with you uh, 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 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, once again. Finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another. We can be hard on one another. Can you all talk to me? Am I right about it? We can be. Sometimes our Pentecostal, spirit-filled, ironclad, holier-than-thou DNA kind of causes us to be a little coarse with people. We can be. You know, we can be hard on our children. We expect them to be almost perfect because you grew up in the Word. You grew up in a Christian home. You grew up with conviction. Yeah, you did too, but it took you some time to get it right. <laughs> Hello? Am I right about that? Sometimes we can be hard on each other. You know why? Sometimes I think we take each other for, for granted and we take advantage of each other's kindness because the stunts that we play with each other, if we were to do that with folk out there in the world, you know you got something coming back at you. But in the church, we have a tendency to play down and be condescending. So let's love one another. Amen. Let's take time for one another. Let's show compassion for one another. I want to give you one last scripture, Acts 3.16. Acts 3.16, this blessed me the other night, excuse me, the other day, and I want to share it again, and then I want to open up the questions, answers, dialogue, I want to pray with you all, and then we'll be dismissed. Acts 3.16, and his name, and his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong. And you see and know, yes, the faith which comes from Jesus has given this man perfect soundness in the presence of you all. I love that scripture. It's a loaded scripture. Let me help you out. Now, I use the word Jesus, but I probably should have said God, but, you know, I'm kind of happy tonight, so I'm interchanging the two. But technically, this faith came from the Lord as a gift. God gave this gift to you, and it's called the gift of faith. I don't know why Peter had this angle. I don't know why Peter had this motive. But when he looks at the religious crowd, when he looks at all of the skeptics, all of the cynics, everybody who's opposing him, all of the adversaries, he says, you know what? It is in his name, our Father's name. Yes, through faith in his name, that the man that you saw lame from his mother's womb, that you saw begging for alms every single day, that has never walked in his entire life, make no mistake about it. It is through the faith that God gave. Now, where did it, now who got the faith here? And maybe this is a great question, a good place to ask the question. So when Peter references the faith, who had the faith here? Who had the faith in this conversation, in this incident? Who might have had the faith that Peter relates to? Somebody give me a shout out. Who had the faith? So Peter says, in his name, through faith in his name, this man is made strong. Who had the faith here? The man. Okay. The man who was named. Some of y'all would say the man who was named had the faith. Somebody else. Peter. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? 
It was so many people in the story. So, yeah. Why we're going through John and then why we had it, right? You're both correct. The man had to have a faith that although I had been here all my life, and you know, when we think about man, we always think 40, 50, 60, 70. He could have been 17 years old. Most likely he was younger just because of the age a range of life expectancy in that day and time. Probably a young man. Probably 17, 18, 19 years old. However long it was, that man had to have a faith that these two preachers going to pray, something would happen through them. So what I wanted was money, but they're asking me to get up and walk. How embarrassing am I about to be trying to get up and walk? No good and well, I ain't walked all this time. Because this is the first prayer meeting I've sat through. The man had the faith. But number two, don't you think Peter had faith as well? Don't you think Peter could have kept on with his old religious prayer going, pious ways? But for whatever reason, he says, you know what? Let's put into action the things we've seen our, our Savior do. Don't you think that require a little bit of faith? Doesn't it require faith for you to lay hands on the sick? I mean, come on, talk to me tonight. I know my time is almost up, but we read the scriptures all the time. And you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Doesn't that, that, that require a little bit of faith from you when someone says, pray for me and pray for me right now? And, and you, you got to, okay, you got you to real quick, got to do inventory. Okay, did I pray this morning? Okay, did I pray last night? Okay, when was happened last time I prayed for somebody? Okay, am I about to be embarrassed here? But somehow or another, you kick in and you're going to have to pray. Amen. Man, I, 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 I need you to stay ready so you don't have to go get ready. Stay prayed up so when someone asks you to pray, you ain't got to go through this whole laundry list of do's and don'ts and sins and unconfessed and confessed sin so you don't get embarrassed. Pray. But it takes faith. Peter had to have obviously a faith because somewhere in this world, he does not want to revert back to where it used to be, doubting, denying, cursing, and being that old religious church man. Silver and gold have I none. But here's what I have. Oh boy, here we go, trusting but trembling. <laughs> in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. I don't think he gave that command intrepidated. I don't think he gave that command intimidated. I don't think he gave that command doubting. I believe for the first time in his life, he was ready to see some action. And it happened. So let's go back to modern day 2024. What is it right now you're believing God for? What is it right now you need to increase your faith in? And cre increase your faith. Remember now, this is not concocted faith. This is not mechanical faith. I want to say that clearly. Please hear me tonight when I say this. This is not mechanical faith. What does that mean? Do not go to AI, chat GPT, AI, and give me three keys of faith and think it's going to work for you. Sounds good. Do not go to YouTube. I beg of you. Do not go to Google and find five keys to great faith, all right? This faith is not mechanical. And I say that because there was a movement back in the 80s and 90s. It was a word of faith movement. You all remember the prosperity movement, money coming to me now, right? You all remember that, name it and claim it and grab it and bag it. And then you confess it and then possess it. And then six months later, it was repossessed, right? But you never got about it around to telling people about that part of the testimony, right? There was a faith movement. What, what, what happened? They put more faith in faith than they did in God. Your faith is not in faith because there was a movement. That hurt a lot of people because you, you, you caught it, you, 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 you kind of sent a message that we got God on a speed dial and we have the power to command him to do this and that. Wait a minute, that ain't the God that we serve. The God that we serve is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. He's sovereign. He can do whatever he want to do, when he want to do it, and can't nobody make, nothing, make, make him do anything different. But because we took advantage of desperation, of gullible and vulnerable people, Mega churches were built, underwritten, financed, debts paid off, all because of the concoction of creating faith. So now faith is in faith and not faith in God. Does that make sense to everybody tonight? Be careful. Be careful because there's still those remnants today online in our churches. We ain't mentioned Jesus. We've not mentioned his perfect will. We've not mentioned the sovereignty of God. We've not mentioned the, 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 the providentialness of God. We've not even mentioned the theology of suffering. And all of that can be found in scripture. Here's what we talk about. Child, if only you believe, if only you believe, it's going to happen to you. I don't know if I have scripture for that. If it's God's will, if it's God's will, it will happen for you as you pray by faith. Let me give you another one since y'all are mad at me. Um... I know I'm split here when I say this, but just hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. I am, I am sometimes hesitant when I hear people say, child, you know, prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. Watch out. No, it's the God who answers prayer that changes. I, I know what you're trying to say. Again, I'm splitting here a little bit, a little bit in the semantics. 
But I don't want to create this, watch where I'm going with this. I don't want to create this illusion that if I put my neology in, if I put my prayer energy in, it's going to force God's hand. So now I'm buying all these books on prayer, all these books on the mechanics of prayer. And, and don't get me wrong, I want you to learn. But don't forget, he's still God. And if he has not willed for you to get that brand new car, you ain't going to get it. If he has not willed for you to win the lottery, you ain't going to win it. So don't even play it, right? If he hadn't willed for you just yet to be married, uh, you can pray all you want. Maybe this is the thing he's working out in you first so you can pray till the cows come home. But hear me when I say this, sometimes we play on the ignorance and the vulnerability of church Christians. So now there's more of an emphasis on the practice of prayer than it is the God who answers prayer. I like to teach people, pray, pray to the Lord, but be open for his answer. Be open and receptive and receive. Are you all with me tonight? His will. I hope I'm not confusing anybody when I say that, because we have a young generation of people who want spirituality, but they do not want the church. Do you hear me tonight? They want to sense spiritual advancement, but they do not want the family of God. That leaves them open, vulnerable, and isolated. Okay? Think about it. Think about it. Mom, pray for me. Mom, pray for me. Child, I'm pray for you. Come on to church. I don't want to go to church, but pray for me. You got to say amen. They live in my house like they live in your house. Okay? Think about it. Oh, I'm blessed. I'm highly blessed and favored. And they go through all of the chants, all of the quotes, and they want grandma to pray and pray for me. But I'm not ready to, I'm not ready to live right. But yet I want you to pray for me. Okay? Let's remind a generation, Judges 2.10, there rose a generation that knew not God nor the things he had done for Israel. May our focus, our faithfulness be fixed on Jesus. Jesus makes it very clear, and I'm finished. Acts 3.16. He says, yes, the faith which comes through him has given this man perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Let's, let, let, let's reconcile one thing. God moves through faith, but it wasn't your faith that you found somewhere. It was a faith that came from him. Where did we learn faith? We learned it in his word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the word of God. Here's my safety net tonight. As long as I stay in the framework of God's word, I believe I'm in his will. The minute I step outside of his word and I can't validate or back something with his word is the minute I begin to ask myself, am I in God's will? Okay. I said a whole lot tonight. I probably angered some of you tonight, but I'm open for questions and answers on tonight. I would love to entertain any questions tonight about Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4. We talked about boldness tonight. We talked about faith tonight. We talked about prayer tonight. We talked about just being people who are closer to Jesus tonight. And, and if there's any questions tonight, uh, maybe there's a, a, a point or maybe there's a, 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 a principle that you've learned or you sense and felt you want to bring out. I, I want you to have that platform and I want you to be open to that tonight because this is how we all learn. I'm going to learn some things from you all as we build community around the word of God. Any questions tonight? Any questions tonight? 756. Any questions? Sister Joyce. First of all, you, the question for those that are online, is when you feel led to pray for somebody and they themselves do not desire that prayer and ask you not to pray, the only one answer I can give you is this, don't pray, don't pray publicly for them at least. Because I don't want you to violate their permission. I don't want you to disrespect their will in the name of doing something righteous. God is still listening to your prayers. Your prayers will be more powerful out of obedience and honor to that person's request than us being demonstrative and being sometimes self-righteous. When we're doing a witnessing campaign, uh, uh, passing out those cars, I was off of uh, Central Avenue, and uh, the young lady at the restaurant, uh, I invited her. to, And I, I, knew, I knew it was going to be a challenge because she had the appearance and the look of someone in the New Age world and all, of the, and all that. But it was okay, and, and it, was, it don't matter to me. I invited her to church, told her God has a plan for her life, and she said, oh, no, I don't. I said, no, 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 that's not that type of church. And so I gave her a whole rundown. Oh, yeah, it's going to be an awesome service. We love you. We're young, blah, 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 blah. She said, oh, wow. Mm. Okay, because she had automatically been turned off for churches. Young African-American girl. But again, she was out in the whole spirituality, new age stuff. And uh, 
she was kind enough to receive the invite card and said, hmm, I'll think about it. I knew you weren't going, but I'll think about it. I said, well, awesome. You know what? Do you mind me taking a selfie with you so I can uh, encourage our church members? Oh, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Now, I could have forced it right then and there. But you know what? Out of relationship that I did not have with her, I didn't want to press it because I would hate to let my good be evil spoken of. Amen. Another question. If there's a question tonight or even a comment or an observation about the teaching in the word tonight, this is a perfect time to share. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for showing my ignorance tonight. <laughs> and I honor you for that. No, thank you. Um, had I probably dug a little deep and read, kept reading, I probably saw that and did not say that stupid thing about him being 17, 18 years old. But thank you. The man was at least 40 years old. 40 over. Now, my question back to you, Mr. Scholar, why is the number 40 so important in the Bible? All right. It's a miracle. It's a long time. Mm -hmm. I read somewhere years ago that when you see the number 40, nobody was sitting there with a calendar and a stopwatch in the Old Testament or the New Testament. But they, 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 he was on the mountaintop for 40 years. Well, no one was really there with a calendar and you know, had the lunar moon and all that. So, okay, but it always represents a lengthy, long period of time. That's the revelation behind 40, oftentimes in scripture. And to your credit and your correct, it really wants to reinforce that this was no overnight sensation. It was a long period of time. Thank you for that tonight. Someone else? Yes, ma'am. One more on this side, and I gotta get someone on this side to balance out the conversation. The, the, the Israelites wandered 40 years, uh -huh. and then it wasn't Noah, somebody else 40 years. Well, well, Moses led the children of Israel through the, wander, for, through the, through the wilderness. For 40 years. But again, no moon was there with an eye calendar, right? But it always represents a long period of time for that very reason Brother Crawford was saying. So uh, they, they came out of Egypt, they go into the wilderness, and then they come into the promised land. And I don't know, I'm looking kind of room, uh, 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 but Jeff has been, and I'm trying to look around the room, anybody else who's going to Israel with me. But man, one of the joys of driving, of going to Israel is when we take that trip from the north, Jeff, you remember, you, you might have been asleep because, you know, everybody has jet, I'm sure everybody have jet lag, everybody have jet lag. I'd be taking pictures of everybody where they just knocked out, they think they up and down, they go. But if you remember, when we left the north in Galilee, we took that, that, that three and a half hour drive from the north down, uh, we came down from Galilee all the way down to Jericho. Right. And somewhere. And I don't know if we mentioned this on your tour or not, but obviously we start looking at Jericho. It's still under Palestinian rule to this day, but it's still an ancient one of the cities in the Bible. But and that's to the right of us. But to the left of us over the river and on that mountain scene where Jordan, the, the country Jordan is, you see the mountain of Nebo. And Nebo was that place where Moses, the Bible says, I just read it the other day, where Moses was able to see the promised land, but because of his disobedience, he never entered the promised land. And I've often wondered to myself how painful that must be to be able to see something that you, will, you yourself will never be able to enter into. Amen. Thank you for the observation. Somebody on this side. Yes, Sister Nikki, thank you so very much. <laughs> now I'm mess with you. Anybody, just anybody. I feel balanced with somebody on this side. All right, while y'all are getting together and thinking about it on Family Feud, I'll go back over this side just for a few more. Sister Ajane. Take your time. <laughs> I'm, I'm familiar with the passage. Your question is, just for clarity's sake on my end. Your question is. Well, the question was asked, and to, and to, your, to her question tonight was, in the accounts in the scriptures where the Bible says that the man brought his son to Jesus and said, why couldn't your church, or why couldn't your disciples cast the devil out? This response was, these kind come out, they don't come out, but by 
fasting, and prayer. Okay? I think, and, and, and help me if I'm wrong, I think your question is, obviously their faith alone wasn't enough. Or was, can there be a situation where faith, even in and of itself, not be enough? Am I sort of on that question or clarify for me? Without fasting, okay. I believe he can. I believe he can. But the, the scriptural orthodoxy in me says you have to require you you have to include and involve fasting, particularly as you want to go deeper. The old folk would say it this way: prayer moves God. That excuse me, prayer speaks to God. Fasting moves God. And when anytime you sacrifice, there's no more words, no more lip power, lip knowledge. Now you're saying, God, I mean business with this one. And I think that's the element that fasting brings. A lot of times fasting today is very popular with, with people because of weight loss. But reality, if you can fast for weight loss, you can fast for spiritual gain. Because there will be levels and there will be devils that don't come out. But by adding prayer and fasting, because again, you are now saying, God, no matter how much faith I have, this is my sacrifice to demonstrate to you that this isn't about me. It's more about your power. Okay? Yes, ma'am. My, my response to, and just again, for those that are listening and watching online, the Living Bible gives a more stronger emphasis of Peter taking the lead, and the man really had no choice but to respond and react. Your question is, my response obviously to that, about the, the faith of the man. Let me say this to you, nothing hurts me more, and nothing disappoints us more when you want to help somebody, but they won't receive that help. Because they themselves don't believe that whatever you're offering will work. Uh, from a time perspective, I don't know. I don't know how it was a knee-jerk reaction or not. What, well, that's why I don't read the Living Translation from time to time, but that's, that's between you and your prayer time with the Lord. Right? <laughs> that, I'm just having fun. I can buy that, I'll call it a knee-jerk reaction. I can buy that immediate response or reaction where faith wouldn't require it, but for Peter. I still like to think and believe somewhere in all of that, no matter how much time elapsed, he had to make a decision. Because going back to what Joyce was saying earlier, we run across people all the time. It is obvious you need help. It is obvious you need prayer. It's obvious you need a helping hand, but they themselves don't touch me. I don't want none of it. He could have had that posture. He could have had that part. I don't know. I wasn't there. I'm just trying to tell you. I'm just going with the Bible. So, you know what I'm saying? But I love that perspective as well. Either way it goes, faith was presented. Faith was demonstrated. Did they receive their healing? Do you believe it was valid? Do you believe that it was valid? It was legitimate? Okay. Okay. That, that, Sister Chambers, that takes me back to the fact that God's word ultimately will be the healer. And even if it is a quick reaction, who are we to place God in a certain ABC route of doing things? 
I understand what you're saying because there have been many times, and we've all been in those type of services where you just kind of came for a regular service, but the prophet in town, the evangelist in town, and it could have been someone in resident in the house, just felt led of the Lord to minister, healing. And that person didn't have a lot of time to go back and think this thing through. But the fact that they were there and they received it, we don't know why. I mean, think about all of the accounts of healing in, this, in the New Testament, Old Testament. I'm not sure every one of them required a textbook faith lesson first versus God doing it. And maybe the faith was demonstrated after the healing because we clearly do see that this 40-year-old plus man didn't get his healing go home. But he decides not to exercise and walk out his faith daily. So I think it's a great observation. It should lead us all back to the multiple wonders of God that he is sovereign in his healing power. And Sister Joanna, I long for those days soon. I long for those days soon. Again, I'm living in a particular small window of a season asking myself, how can I best serve this ministry? And what is it that we need to get back to doing for those days? I know they're there, I know they're here, and I know everything has been done has been done for a season and a reason, but our best days are yet, have yet not been lived yet in this ministry. Thank you for the reminder tonight. Amen. Amen. Uh-oh, uh-oh. I'm trying to close out. Deacon Robinson has his hand up. Deacon Robinson, yes, sir. You will have the final question thought. No, go ahead. You deserve the opportunity to share. Please help yourself. And every once in a while, God will demonstrate his grace and power without any reaction involved from that person. Luke chapter 7, yeah. Send your word, and I'll believe. Yeah. Yeah. The wonder tonight is this. We serve an awesome God. Amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Thank you, Deacon Robinson. Thank you all for your contributions tonight. Amen. Amen. Let's just take a moment and worship the Lord tonight. Let's just give him praise for his healing, for his grace. Come on, let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, we bless your name tonight, God. We just send up an evening offering of praise. We send up an evening offering of worship to you. Thank you that you are sovereign. Father, you are God alone. And tonight we just acknowledge this. We thank you for healing. Thank you for miracles. Thank you for signs and wonders. Father, thank you that faith that comes from heaven, faith that, that, that comes from your word, and you gave us this faith that we believe that you are ultimately God. Thank you that you are present help in the time of trouble. For those that are seeking healing, thank you, for God, for healing. For those that are seeking deliverance, Father, we thank you for deliverance for them and their families. For those that are just seeking uh, uh, growth and in, in, in depth in you, Thank you that you hear our prayers and you'll answer them. For you said in the word, if any man hunger and thirst after righteousness, that they shall be filled. Tonight, Father, and I'm just going to ask this for a moment tonight, if you all don't mind, while your eyes are closed, would you just lift your hands to the Lord tonight? Come on, just lift those hands tonight to the Lord. Father, as we lift our hands tonight, may it be a sign of surrenderance, a sign of yieldedness, a sign of humility, a sign that says, God, we need your help. Without you, we are nothing. Without you, we are nothing. So we lift our hands to you, for we are, the ch we are your children, and you are our Father. And we reach to you to say, Father, thank you for drawing closer. You said in the word, if we would draw close to you, you would draw nigh to us. So, Father, thank you that men and women here and those that are listening and watching online, that we're being drawn closer to you in your word, in our prayer time, and the love that we show and compassion one to another. By all men will know that we are your church and disciples. By the love we show for one to another. As we lift these hands to you, we say, Lord, less of us, but more of you. Less of us, 
more of you. We decrease that you would increase. Bless the church. Bless these, your precious people. But this we ask in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody, clap those hands and let's say praise the Lord tonight. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I want to thank every one of you all for the contributions and thank you all for uh, sharing your expressions, your questions, your thoughts tonight. It, it, it only makes Bible study community richer when you are, have the liberty and the confidence to share, ask your questions. We're here to learn. We're here to grow. I want you to go home feeling like, you know what? I'm growing closer to the Lord. I'm growing closer to the Lord. He's growing closer to me. All right. Amen. Listen, tonight, as for those that are online, thank you for being with us. We're going to prepare ourselves to give an offering to the Lord tonight. Please allow me to do this. I am going to sew on my phone tonight and give on the behalf of my wife and I. She's, uh, I think she's working late, I think, something going on. But on her behalf, I do want to greet you all and say God bless you all. Uh, all I know, Brother Herb, is when I got home, she had her counseling banner up out of the box. So I get, I think she's part of the crowd that was this weekend coming up. She's excited. But on her behalf, I challenge, I encourage every one of you all in your giving tonight. Even on this Thursday night, thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Uh, envelopes are available. If those of you that want to give on the envelopes or others as me joining on your phone giving, thank you in advance. For those that are watching online, thank you as well for sowing and supporting. Please know that we cannot continue on. We can't do this without your generosity and your goodwill towards the city church. Thank you so much for your giving. Father, tonight as we prepare ourselves to be dismissed bless our, our our journeys home and thank you for the word of the lord and may we think about the boldness and may we think about the clarity and the 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 the, the, the power of you answering prayer and uh the faith you give in the word that we would believe you for great things bless each and every one of these in jesus name come on everybody say amen all right, listen, after you've given, consider yourself so blessed and dismissed. Listen, don't be in a rush to go home, hug somebody, meet a friend, meet somebody. We'll see you this weekend. Don't forget, we've got a big, big weekend. Saturday, we'll be here for Kingdomnomics. And uh, you all already know the terrain and know the outline. It's going to be a great, great Saturday. Then Sunday, of course, we will kick, crank it up. Isn't that, I'm sorry, am I wrong? Not Saturday? Sunday. I'm sorry. Nothing Saturday? Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sunday. Thank you for that clarification. All right. God bless everybody. Have a good night.